the Shiki Science Show clips. So first then, what is the protein folding problem? Well, when I normally talk about proteins on this channel, I typically just draw a circle and write the protein's name inside. However, proteins don't look like that. Proteins come in all different shapes and sizes, and it can be said that the final structure of a protein can determine what that protein's function is. For example, my favourite protein, P53, has the region that enables it to bind DNA. It has a DNA binding domain. And so if another protein also had the same DNA binding domain, I would also go, hmm, maybe it's going to bind DNA. But that's the final structure of a protein. All proteins are composed of a series of building blocks referred to as amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids, and the sequence of those amino acids dictates the final structure of a protein. So the protein folding problem seeks to understand how the sequence of amino acids enables the production of the 3D structure of a protein. So the protein folding problem is under the assumption that all the information for folding the individual amino acids, otherwise referred to as the residues, is actually in the amino acid sequence. And this assumption was proved experimentally by Christian Affenson in a very nice series of experiments where he nicely demonstrates that all the information for folding residues is in the amino acid sequence. And this is well summarised in this figure here. So the protein that he was looking at is called ribonuclease. And to form the final 3D structure of ribonuclease, there are four bonds that are really important. And as I failed to mention earlier, it's the formation of a variety of different bonds between these different amino acids that actually enables these 3D structures of proteins to form. So what he did with this ribonuclease is that he added chemicals, in this case urea and mercaptoafenol, that caused these bonds to break, which you can see here. And this caused the structure of the protein to unravel. By then removing this urea and reoxidizing the solution, the protein structure was able to reform. As the conditions now enabled these disulfide bonds to reform, also allowing the structure to reform and restoring the activity of the ribonuclease. However, if you change the order of events such that you reoxidize the solution before urea is removed, then the protein incorrectly folds. However, this can be restored by adding a reducing agent that then enables the native structure of the protein to be formed with the correct bonds forming between the amino acids. And so effectively, what all of this does prove is that all of the information that we need is in the amino acid sequence. And so the question then is how, hence the protein folding problem. So what do we know? Well, we know that there are different forces that are driving a protein into its 3D folded structure. And the final structure, often referred to as the native structure, has the lowest free energy. And so one way of kind of envisioning how this process works, this folding process, is the protein folding funnel, whereby you can see there's different routes of folding that result in the final protein structure. And it also suggests that the order in which the protein starts to fold is also important for achieving the native state. So what are these different forces that drive a protein to fold? Well, there are a variety of different forces that come into play, but one thing I want to mention is the importance of the type of amino acid that's present in the sequence. Different amino acids have different so-called R groups that contain different atoms, and this gives the amino acids individual different properties. So some amino acids have a positive charge, whilst others have a negative charge, and some have no charge at all. Well, that's never really quite true. And so as an example, an amino acid with a positive charge may be forming interactions with another amino acid with a negative charge. But these two amino acids don't have to be adjacent in the amino acid sequence. They could be much farther apart, but due to the 3D conformation of the final protein, they could be now in close proximity. Another thing that is worth mentioning is that we understand protein folding by using the different levels of protein organisation. So starting with the amino acid sequence, that is often referred to as the primary structure. And this final structure here of the 3D folded protein is referred to as the tertiary structure. And so in between the primary structure, the sequence, and the tertiary structure, the final 3D structure of the protein, are, you guessed it, secondary structures. The two main secondary structures are beta strands and alpha helices. And it's understood that the series of different strands and helices within the secondary structure make up the tertiary structure. So actually, if we take a closer look at this tertiary structure here, we can actually see that 
it's made up of these different helices, these alpha helices, and these different beta strands, the, the ones that look like arrows. And it turns out that different amino acids have different propensities of forming either beta strands or alpha helices. And so already we've got some information about amino acid sequence and what the secondary structure could be. But looking at different amino acids propensities of forming beta sheets or alpha helices is nowhere near sufficient to be able to create a 3D final structure of a protein. We need a lot more information. And one really valuable bit of information comes from the use of evolutionary co-variation data. Now that may sound complicated, but we'll get to it. Basically, this approach uses the power of comparing the protein sequence to the same protein sequence found in different organisms. For example, mice, rats, snakes, dogs, cats, whales, you get my point. And you take the same sequences from these different organisms and you form multiple sequence alignments. You see which amino acids are the same or different in the different species. Now, this is really important for identifying amino acids that are really important in the folding process. And so if we go back to that example I mentioned earlier about having a positively charged amino acid and a negatively charged one that are forming an interaction in 3D space that's important for the final structure of a protein, I can generate a hypothetical example to try and explain to you the importance of this evolutionary co-variation data. So in this example sequence, Let's say we've got nine amino acids here and one of them is this positively charged amino acid. So it could be lysine and one of them is negatively charged. So it could be glutamate. And let's just assume for simplicity that the rest of the amino acids are glycine. Okay, so we've got this positively charged amino acid and we've got this negatively charged one. Now let's compare this sequence to these different species. So we can see in this case that the dog also has the same positive and negative charged amino acid. It's got that lysine and glutamate, and it's also present in the whale. But if we look at the cat, the cat actually has them switched round. It's got the negatively charged amino acid first and the positively charged one second. And what you might notice as well is that we don't seem to have any species that have two positive amino acids in either of those positions or two negative amino acids in either of those positions suggesting that those two residues show evolutionary co-variation. If one of them changes, the other one has to change to maintain an interaction between those two positions in the final 3D structure. 